Okay, uh, so to begin then, um, <clears throat> we obviously study Marxist economics and the reason for, for having this school uh, today on Marxist economics is because we see the, the, the economic organisation of society as fundamental to the way that the rest of society is organised. And as I said, there isn't time to go into a detailed study of all the aspects of Marxist economics uh, today, or in, particularly not in this session. So I am going to focus on one particular aspect, the most fundamental aspect, which is the labour theory of value. But to really grasp Marx's ideas about the labour theory of value, we need to understand where his ideas came from. And so I will try to cover, again, in a necessarily, uh, because of time, a necessarily superficial way, the main trends in economic thought prior to Marx. I'll focus in particular on those ideas, those pre-Marx ideas, which later became central to his theories, the, the, the building blocks that he used to come up with his theories. And I will then go on, I'll move on to explaining Marx's ideas themselves and how he took those building blocks and turned them into the, the kind of ideas that we, we know today, the ones we read in wage, labour and uh, capital, value, price and profit, and capital itself, obviously. Marx, in developing his theories, stood on the shoulders of, of great thinkers of the past. He studied them, he criticised them mercilessly, and on that basis uncovered the laws, uh, the basic laws, the most fundamental laws, that govern the capitalist mode of production. So, to begin then, to start off, serious study of political economy really began in the 17th century, the 1600s, and it began in England with a school of thought known as mercantilism. Now, as the name suggests, that theory basically held that wealth and value was the product of commerce and trade. By buying and selling, you created value, you created wealth. Uh, buying cheap and selling dear, basically. It was the circulation of commodities that the mercantilists thought created value. Now this was obviously the political economy of a rising merchant class uh, at that time. And what you had at that time was an alliance between that, that nascent bourgeoisie, the rising merchant class, and the state. With the former providing wealth, obviously for themselves, but also for the nation state. And the latter, the state itself, providing uh, protection in England, of course, in the form of the, the navy. Protecting merchant ships going around the place to do their trade and creating wealth for everybody. And so mercantilist economic theory, basically, pr promoted the idea of state intervention in the economy with the aim of strengthening one particular state or empire against another particular state or empire. It was essentially protectionism. The kind of policies that they advocated were, uh, were that colonies were forbidden from trading with other powers other than the home, the, the, the imperial power itself. Tariffs on foreign goods were extremely high. There were subsidies given to national industries by the government. And the government tried to run a trade surplus with everyone that it traded with so that precious metals, gold and silver, would flow into the home nation, it would flow into London from the colonies because they were running a trade surplus. Now probably the best um, exponent of these ideas of mercantilist theory was Thomas Munn. And this is the guy you see in the first extract there. Uh, who wrote this book, Treasure by Foreign Trade, which is considered, certainly considered by Adam Smith, to be the most uh, brilliant exposition of mercantilist theory. And that is spelled right, foreign, it's just obviously old, old fashioned. Um, <clears throat> now these ideas, these mercantilist ideas, and, and I won't read out that quote, but you can basically see there, what he's saying is, the way a, well, a nation gets wealthy is by, um, Import, exporting uh, more than it imports, basically. Uh, it's all about circulation of commodities. And these ideas really reached their high point in England with the Long Parliament of the 17th century, 1640 to 1660, I think. The English Civil War, that kind of period. And that, of course, is not surprising, given the character of the conflict that was taking place in society at that time between the old feudal world and the rising capitalist class. Um, and the, the situation that that created. And you can see then in, in extract two there, the Navigation Act from that period, 1651. I've included the whole thing because believe it or not, that is all one sentence, that paragraph. Um, but I've underlined the important bit there at the end, which is basically talking about how everything, um, 
everything that is imported into England, everything that, that is involved in English trade is carried out by English ships and by, by English uh, sailors. And this sort of leaves this kind of protectionist approach. And although the legislation that was passed uh, in, the, in the Cromwell era was all uh, withdrawn by uh, or revoked by Charles II when he was restored to the throne, they passed almost identical laws uh, immediately afterwards. Um, and they were they're collectively known as the Navigation Acts, and these are kind of the best example of, of mercantilist uh, economic policy. So on from uh, mercantilism then, the development of economic thought crossed over to the continent, uh, to France specifically, in the 18th century, in the 1700s. And a group of thinkers known as les économistes uh, at that time, or people we know today as the physiocrats, made a big step forward in their understanding of political economy, on from what the mercantilists had. Because whilst the mercantilists saw wealth and value as being created by the circulation of commodities, the physiocrats saw value as coming from labour. It was the first step, from productive work, basically. And it was the first step towards a labour theory of value. But there is uh, a big caveat to this, because at that time, and particularly in France, economies were largely agricultural. And so the physiocrats believed that it was only agricultural labour that produced value. Everything else, they said, industrial labour, non-agricultural labour in any form, artisans, merchants, all these people were, were unproductive appendages to the value-producing system, to productive work, which was agricultural labour. Because, they said, that to be an artisan or a merchant, you require the produce of the land, you require food in order to survive. So the real productive labour comes from the land and everything else is unproductive. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and they said that profit then is simply rent taken by landowners from the productive activity that is carried out on their land, basically. This was their understanding of political economy. And uh, a fellow called François Quesnay, uh, who wrote, uh, well, he drew actually this, this uh, economic table, this tableau économique, um, which is a, a diagram, basically, of how he saw um, the economy working. Uh, this is the best example of physiocratic theory uh, around. And you've got an extract of his explanation from the Tableau Economique there in number three. And you can see he's saying the productive expenditures are employed in agriculture, blah, blah, blah. The sterile expenditures are made upon handicraft products, housing, clothing, and so on, other kind of labour. Um, but nevertheless, this was a step forward because it recognised labour in some form was the creator of value. The other reason, actually, the tableau economique is a step forward is because that, it, that diagram demonstrates interrelationships between classes within a national economy. They're not the classes as we understand them as Marxists, but they are classes of people within a nation and how the economy works on the basis of their interaction. That is also a step forward in comparison to mercantilist theory, which was all about trade between nations uh, not about the internal dynamics of classes within a particular nation. Okay, so moving on again then, it was around this time, actually, the 18th century, of course, that the Industrial Revolution was gathering steam. That's a, that's a joke, that's an Industrial Revolution <laughs> joke. That's as good as it's getting, so uh, <laughs> enjoy it. Um, it was around this time the Industrial Revolution, yeah, was, was, was gathering steam, picking up pace, and here we come to the ideas uh, of Adam Smith, um, who wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776, the year of the American Revolution. Now his ideas were based upon the ideas of the physiocrats and he was a very sharp critic of mercantilism. And he made yet another step forward then, on top of what the physiocrats had done, when he said that it's not just agricultural labour that produces value uh, and creates wealth, but it's labour in general. And so we can really say with Smith that we come for the first time to a, a general labour theory of value. It's crude and it's underdeveloped, but it is nevertheless a labour theory of value in the form that we would recognise it from Marx's writings. Basically what he said is that the value of something is determined by the labour time involved in its production. And you can see that then in extracts 4 and 5, uh, both of which are relatively short. Uh, take five as an example. Uh, if among a nation of hunters, for example, it usually costs twice the labour to kill a beaver, which it does to kill a deer, one beaver should naturally exchange for or be worth two deer. 
It's a, it's a labour theory of value. And we can say with Smith then, who, who is referred to as the father of economics by, by bourgeois economists, we can say that he marked the beginning of a period of classical economy. People that Marx calls uh, vulgar economists, but this is, this is what is, is, it means, classical economy. And these ideas were taken up and developed by other thinkers in that same period. Thomas Malthus, probably uh, best known for his, his ideas on, on overpopulation and so on. Um, he, he did also develop political, other ideas in political economy. And he developed some of Smith's ideas as well. And there's an extract from him, well, there's actually an extract from Marx at number six, criticising Malthus, explaining that he did make a contribution. But in general, Marx was actually extremely scathing of Malthus. And in that, in that text, Theories of Surplus Value there, uh, Marx uh, describes Malthus's ideas as childish babble. Um, so he obviously is not a big fan. David Ricardo then was probably, was also around at this time, also developed Smith's ideas. Ricardo and Malthus had some arguments, they had some disagreements, but both of them fundamentally accepted the ideas of Adam Smith and just saw kind of different interpretations of some of the things that he said. But Ricardo probably, certainly Marx's opinion, was probably the best representative of this school of classical economy. And you can see in extract seven there, his take on the, the Ricardo's take on the labour theory of value is a good explanation of it. And, uh, and all, but all, the point is all of these thinkers, all of classical economy, accepted the labour theory of value, accepted the idea that the value of something is determined by the labour time involved in its production. Now these were the ideas of the Enlightenment, they were the ideas of the triumph of the bourgeoisie, they provided a very important insight into the workings of capitalism. These people, these classical economists, they were the immediate predecessors to Marx. And Marx's ideas, Marxist economics in particular, owes a huge debt to these people. Um, and uh, and we, owe, we owe a lot. We should pay homage to their contributions uh, because they allowed Marx to develop his theories on from the discoveries that they made. But of course these people also had major failings, major confusion in their ideas. I'll mention just a couple of these, I obviously can't go into to it all. The first relates to um, commodity fetishism, which Marx does describe in Capital. He describes what he means by commodity fetishism, and that description is extract eight. Uh, and you can see the bit I've underlined there. It's nothing but the definite social relation between men themselves, which assumes here for them, as in the classical economists, the fantastic form of a relation between things. So I'll just explain what, what this means briefly. What he's saying is that capitalism, as a system, turns relations on their head. <coughs> and it does this because there's a division of labour between people. When we think about the labour in society, it's not one abstract mass. It's divided up into the labour that each of us as individuals are capable of carrying out. And that therefore necessitates the production of individual commodities which, to satisfy everybody's wants and needs, must be exchanged, must be traded. There must be circulation of commodities. Now Marx says, in reality, and, and we recognise this is clearly true, in reality what this is, is an exchange, it's a human exchange, it's an exchange between human people, exchanging the product of their labour for the product of someone else's labour so that everybody can survive, it's an exchange between humans. But capitalism, which bases itself on the circulation of commodities, inverts that relationship, which it appears that the relationship is actually between commodities themselves and not between people. This is what Marx means by commodity fetishism. It's taking that appearance, what capitalism makes it seem to be the case, and thinking that that is the reality, when in fact the reality of the situation is obscured beneath the surface. And Marx says basically to get to the heart of the capitalist system, you have to get beyond this commodity fetishism, you have to penetrate that surface and get, uh, get beneath. And this was the mistake of the classical economists. They were unable, or they didn't, penetrate beneath the surface of things. And this is the point that Marx is making in Extract 9, again from Theories of Surplus Value, where he's criticising Ricardo on this exact point. And I won't read out the extract, you can read it for yourselves, but I'll explain what he's saying. He's basically saying that whilst Ricardo did have a labour theory of value, an understanding of what that meant, 
He didn't develop, to it, develop it to its fullest extent. He didn't develop that theory to its logical conclusion. He's saying that Ricardo basically looked at the circulation of commodities only in the context, or rather, he looked at the labour theory of value only in the context of commodities which once produced were circulating and how much, how, how much of one can be exchanged for another that is determined by the labour theory of value. This is the context. Commodities already produced which are currently circulating. What he didn't consider, what, Ricard, what Marx says Ricardo didn't consider, is the process of the production of those economies. The application of human labour to capital, that relationship between human, human labour and capital. That's what Ricardo doesn't think about in his uh, texts and his ideas. It's that human element, basically, that is obscured to Ricardo. It doesn't, it doesn't matter too much if... if I lost you a bit there, or if you don't understand the theory, it doesn't, that's not important. The, the point is, Marx's criticism of these classical economists is that he didn't go, they didn't go, sorry, sufficiently beneath the surface and penetrate through to the real heart of uh, capitalism. Couldn't get beyond, basically, this commodity fetishism. And Marx, with an understanding of dialectical philosophy, which uh, I'm sure we're all, at least on some level, familiar with, Obviously, that is a philosophy all about penetrating beneath the surface to the real heart of things. Marx was able to do that and develop uh, the labour theory of value accordingly, which I will come to uh, later. So this is the first limitation of the classical economist, an inability to penetrate uh, beneath the surface, uh, uh, unable to get past commodity fetishism. But the second limitation of the classical economists is that they regarded capitalism and this is probably their biggest limitation. They regarded capitalism as an eternal system of society, an eternal way of organising uh, the economy, as opposed to a necessary stage in human evolution. The result was that, that they, they tended to deny the contradictions of capitalism. They denied their importance, and in some cases even denied the existence of contradictions. So we'll take as an example the contradiction of overproduction, which I'll describe in more detail later, although I'm sure we're largely familiar with it. But the idea that that crisis, a crisis in capitalism caused by overproduction could, uh, could take place was denied by the economists, the classical economists. They argued instead that the world economy would tend towards equilibrium, that everything would cancel each other out, and that every, every seller, every producer would find a buyer for their goods. In the act of producing something, they would find someone who was willing to buy. And therefore, things, whilst there might be ups and downs, eventually things would tend towards a natural equilibrium, everything would remain stable and settled and so on. And this idea was most clearly expressed by a classical economist called Jean-Baptiste Say, in something known as Say's Law, and that is in extract 10. Um, and you can see the last sentence underlined there. The mere circumstance of creation of one product immediately opens a vent for other products. Basically what, is, what he's saying there is they will, that the system will tend towards equilibrium uh, and stability. Now Marx pointed out that, uh, well basically he said first of all, Say and these other classical economists are correct when they talk about there being a separation between sale and purchase. That these are two separate events, two separate things uh, in, in, in capital, under capitalism. But Say of course says that these things eventually balance each other out. But Marx says it is actually that fact that Say has identified, this, sep this fact of separation, is precisely that fact actually can cause, or is certainly an element in causing uh, economic crisis, crisis specifically of overproduction. Because he says as capitalism develops, what you, uh, what you see is the growth of things like fictitious capital, of globalization, and what you see gradually as capitalism develops onto a higher and higher plane, you see more and more distance coming between the sale and the, per and the, the, first, the initial sale and the, the final purchase of a particular commodity. Because you end up with middlemen, merchants in the middle who will transport goods around, you can end up with more and more and more of them. And for the, for the initial producer, actually you don't need to find a final buyer for your product before you can produce again. You realise the value of a particular commodity just by selling it to a merchant. And then you can go back and carry on producing. Before a final seller has been 
uh, final purchaser, sorry, has been found. And so that's how, that is precisely that separation that Say talks about as leading to equilibrium. Marx says it's actually that separation that can, that can cause such massive crises of overproduction because you can produce and produce and produce because of the development of capitalism but uh, without actually having anyone who can buy it on the other end. This is the, the criticism that Marx makes. And it is actually precisely that analysis then. Compare what Say says to what Marx says there. And it's, it's that Marxist approach of seeing capitalism as a developing dynamic system, as an evolving thing that grows and changes and creates new, uh, new problems and, and new, uh, new phenomena. It's at that point that uh, sets Marxist economics apart from classical economy, which sees things in very stable, tending towards equilibrium, static kind of forms. You see this actually in all of Marx's writings. Marx in Capital talks about primitive accumulation of capital, the very er the earliest stage is almost the pre-capitalist stage. I will touch on primitive accumulation very briefly uh, in a minute. Um, <clears throat> the very earliest stages of uh, capitalism. And then in the, in the Communist Manifesto, as I'm sure we're familiar with, uh, Marx and Engels talk about globalization, how capitalism is developing and this sort of thing. You can see in everything you read about Marxist economics, you see Marx's approach to capitalism as, as being, it being a dynamic system, constantly developing and changing. And it's very different to what they, this was a limitation that the classical economists had. They didn't see capitalism in that way. Now, ultimately, classical economy was doomed to be forever plagued by these limitations by these contradictions. It was unable to ever, the theorists were unable to ever develop their ideas far enough to be able to overcome these things. And the reason is actually a, um, I suppose you could say it's a political one. Well, before, actually, before we get to the political one, on, on the, in the first instance, the ruling class, the bourgeois class, which these people represented as in their ascendancy, they don't require a labor theory of value, really. They don't need it. What, what good is it to the capitalist class? From their point of view, as long as the system keeps working, as long as they can keep making profits, crisis can be put off for a little bit longer, the system keeps moving, commodities keep circulating, everything keeps going along, there's no value to them, there's no use to them of having a labor theory of value. Serious political economy of the Smith and Ricardo kind is useless to them. What they're much more interested in is mathematical modelling and short-term uh, predictions of how to make the most profit in the, in the next period of time. So continuing serious political economy, continuing development, the overcoming of these limitations, these contradictions is not, it was, it was not worthwhile basically for the bourgeois to invest time in that because it's not required for making profit. But actually, uh, we can go further than that and say it's not just that they didn't need it, it's they actively, at a certain stage, didn't want to develop the ideas around the labour theory of value. They didn't want to develop political economy any further. The reason being that actually the idea that wealth is produced by labour is a very dangerous idea for capitalism. It's a very subversive idea, actually. And of course, as capitalism was developing, the working class was developing, it was gathering its own political representatives who were using exactly this idea of the labour theory of value to advocate the ideas of socialism. And that is exactly what you see in extracts 11, 12 and 13. Uh, 11 is uh, a bourgeois saying this is a bit of a dangerous idea, we should, uh, we should drop this. 12 is a, is a, a socialist saying this means we should, like, labour should have complete control over the economy because we produce all the wealth. And 13 is obviously much later, 1927, but it's just making that point, explaining the, the same thing that I've just explained, basically. Um, <clears throat> that's what those, those extracts are. Um, <clears throat> so not only did they not need it for making profit, they actively didn't want it because it represented a, uh, a subversive idea. And this really is why economics as a science, or political economy, collapsed to be replaced in academic circles with theories about basically how to keep capitalism going rather than how capitalism really works. And today this, in my understanding, is what is taught on, at university economics courses. They don't teach Smith and Ricardo and the labour theory of value. They teach 
marginal utility and uh, and things about how to make more profit, mathematical models, how to make more profit, how to keep the economy going, rather than a deep understanding of uh, of the economy of the labour theory of value. It's the difference between a marginal utility theory and a labour theory of value. And really, then it was left to Marx, we can say, to rescue the labour theory of value from the work of the classical economists, as far as they were able to take it, and for him to then develop it to its fullest extent. And so I'll just briefly then discuss some of his basic principles. Trotsky, well, Marx also said uh, that the labour theory of value is the central law of capitalism. It's the most fundamental uh, question, the law of value, the labour theory of value. And, uh, and Trotsky, uh, in, in extract 14 there, uh, Trotsky explained the basis of that law. And in my opinion, that extract there is the most succinct, uh, the best, kind of sharpest, most concise description of the very basic elements of Marxist economics. Uh, and you should all, if, not, if you can't read it right now, then you should read it uh, later on. I won't read it out, because uh, I'm probably running a little bit short of time. Uh, <coughs> But uh, Marx basically sought to prove this labour theory of value, and he did so in a way that was, in my opinion, much more clear than anyone who came before him. Whilst he took the ideas from Smith and Ricardo, his proof of it, his explanation, was much clearer. And for the, the proof of this theory of the labour theory of value, he started, um, with, uh, he started his economic investigation with the commodity itself, because he said that's the fundamental building block of the whole capitalist system. So we, I will also start with that uh, now. He says, first of all, not everything in society is a commodity. Things produced for our own, by us for our own consumption are not commodities. If I grow vegetables in my garden for my own consumption, that's not a commodity. Commodities, he says, are specifically things that are produced for exchange. And that's why capitalism is dominated by... Uh, or, or the commodity form, basically. The domination of the economy by the commodity form, by the exchange of commodities, is the hallmark of the capitalist system. It's the highest point that we had. There was commodity production, obviously, under feudalism in previous forms of society. But under capitalism, it assumes the dominant form. The circulation of commodities uh, takes over. And Marx says that the co every commodity has two characteristics. This is, this is all part of his proof of the labour theory of value. He says the first characteristic of every commodity is that it possesses what he calls a use value. It is useful in some way. It satisfies some need or some desire. Otherwise, no one would want it. Secondly, he says it has an exchange value. That is a value which allows a, one, a quantity of one commodity to be exchanged for a certain quantity of another commodity. So every commodity has a use value and an exchange value. But with that point about exchange value, a question arises, which is, how do you know how much of one commodity is worth, is another commodity worth? And he says, well, that there must be some property that is common to all commodities, which allows them to be compared and exchanged in certain quantities. It's not physical property, because commodities that have no physical uh, nothing physical in common, no physical properties in common, can still be exchanged. A pineapple and a, and, a, and a mobile phone can still be exchanged in certain quantities, and yet they have absolutely nothing, colour, texture, no physical property whatsoever in common. Marx says uh, that the one thing they have in common <coughs> is the labour time required to produce them. And uh, this is the point, then, that he's making in Extract 15. It's a long extract. It's from the first volume of Capital. That's the point that, that he's making there. This is, then, his la this is the base of the, the, the first step in his labour theory of value, basically. Now, you also see, actually, from that same extract, in the third paragraph of it, that Marx adds something to his labour theory of value, um, which is not present in the theories of the classical economists. Um, which is uh, the question of socially necessary labour. He says it's not just a question of the labour time required to produce something, it's a question of the socially necessary labour time required to produce something. In other words, a lazy worker does not produce more value just because he works 
more slowly or more inefficiently than a regular average worker because that that would be one implication right if you say well the amount of time going into producing something is what gives it value if someone just works really unnecessarily slowly on something does that mean that what they produce is more valuable than someone who produces it uh, comparatively quickly um, and the answer is no and it's because of this socially necessary uh, caveat basically that Marx puts in there he says that the market decides what is socially necessary on the basis of the prevailing technological development on the basis of the average intensity of labor and if um, if a business is unable to produce commodities using only the socially necessary labor time based on these averages in the economy as a whole then its cost of production will be higher than the price at which it is able to sell those commodities and therefore it will go out of business um, so this socially necessary aspect is is quite important um, I could dwell on that longer but I don't have time um, <clears throat> Now Marx also goes on then to talk about this question, I just mentioned price there, and I've been talking about value up till now. Well price and value are very different things uh, for Marxists. And he says, uh, Marx explains that the price of a commodity does not necessarily correspond to its value, they are separate categories uh, in Marxist economics. Price obviously is the, com is the money form of a commodity, and price can fluctuate around the real value of a commodity, it's not fixed to the actual value of a commodity. And this fluctuation, then, is determined by supply and demand, scarcity and abundance, this kind of thing. Have a look at extract uh, 16. That's exactly uh, what Marx is saying in uh, coming out of value, price and profit. There. Now, this, obviously, is the realm of marginal utility theory, fluctuations in price and so on, uh, with which modern economics concerns itself. But uh, a lot of these modern economists, these marginal utility theorists, they say theirs is not just a theory of price, it is a theory of value. They equate price and value. They say they're the same thing, uh, that supply and demand, in fact, determines uh, value. But Marx takes this idea on in value, price and profit. And he says uh, to these, these kind of people, they weren't called marginal utility theorists at that time, but uh, he says to, to whoever they were called at that time, he says, look, uh, what, what you can't explain with this theory is if you take every, if you hypothetically say every commodity has its supply and demand entirely equal, what then determines the price of things? What then determines value, uh, basically? If the supply and demand is entirely balanced out across the whole economy, how then do you determine uh, what value is? And of course, there is no answer to that on the basis of marginal utility theory, because value, point is value is an objective question, but marginal utility theory sees it as entirely subjective, depending on the wants and demands, the needs of the desires of individuals. This is the difference between uh, a theory of value and a theory of prices. And unless we're able to separate those two things out, then uh, we won't actually understand how capitalism works. And that, of course, is the difference between political economy, specifically Marxist political economy, and, uh, and modern economic empiricism. So thus far, Marx has developed, he's explained very clearly the theories of, that came before him, of Smith and Ricardo and so on. Uh, and he's developed them slightly, but not fundamentally. But now we come to probably the most important discovery by Marx, because he, he poses the question, well, look, in the final analysis, if everything, if, commo if all commodities are exchanged at their value, as in over time and across the whole world, all the price fluctuations cancel each other out and everything is being exchanged for its true value, then surely that, then everything will even out. Everyone will be getting what they deserve, basically. Value will, will the, the exchanges will all even out. So he says, well, that leaves the question, where does profit come from? Where does surplus value come from if, it, if all values are actually fundamentally being exchanged for their correct uh, value? And Marx explains that profit there, and this is, this is the crucial discovery, this is the crucial point. Marx explains that profit comes itself from another commodity. That commodity being labour power. The capacity to work, labour power. And he says this is a commodity that can, it's the only commodity that can produce more value than its own value. The classical economists were very confused over this. They didn't know whether people, whether workers were selling their labour or their labour power. Marx says categorically it's the latter, it's their capacity to work. They don't sell their labour, they sell their labour power. 
and this is a this is a commodity like any other and so like any other the uh, the the value of this particular commodity the value of labor power is determined by the amount of labor time involved in its production just like any other commodity on the market so what does that mean concretely well what is actually involved in the production of labor power what is it that enables labor power to exist as a commodity to work to be what what gives it its use value why is it a, a useful commodity well it's uh it's food it's shelter it's uh it's clothing these are the things that are required to produce labor power sorry i've i've skipped over extract 17 apparently oh yeah well that's basically that's what extract 17 is all about um it's this question of of labor power being a commodity and there's also, it's also worth pointing out, there's labour power involved in the reproduction of labour power, if you like. Because it's obviously up to the workers to produce the next generation of workers. And so the maintenance of a family is also a cost involved with the production of labour power. And that therefore goes into the value of labour power. Now the employer then, having taken all these things into, into account and worked out the value of labour power, an employer will pay the workers the value of their labour power, that's the wages, and then put them to work. And by applying human labour to raw materials um, then, and, and, and basically producing com commodities, the, uh, the worker is adding value through their own, their own labour time, through their own labour power. And this is obviously capitalism, I did describe capitalism as we know it. Now it's worth making here a very, very quick, because uh, I am limited on time, a very quick additional point about how we ended up in this situation where one person um, is in a position where they can live off the labour power of others and lots of other people are in a position where all they own is their capacity to work. They're not in a position to do that. Um, <clears throat> the answer is what something I mentioned very briefly earlier. It's the question of primitive accumulation what Marx referred to as the prehistoric stage of capitalism um, <clears throat> and uh, it's in it's there in extract 18 uh, there's a full description of it um, he said the bit underlined says the so-called primitive accumulation therefore is nothing else than the historical process of divorcing the producer from the means of production it was that process that took place in England with the enclosure acts that threw workers off the land basically left them with nothing, owning nothing except their capacity to work. They owned no land, nothing they could use to survive, basically. It was the turning of the turning peasantry into uh, landless wage labourers, basically. That was the process of primitive accumulation of capital, which allowed then capitalism proper to develop. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's a bit of a, a diversion, but it's part of the, of the general explanation, so I put it in, in there. Uh, the uh, okay yes in the process of uh, of commodity production itself then raw materials uh, don't create new value they just transfer the value that they already have if you take you know I, you can take a, a lump of wood and uh, and try and sell it on for more and if you've got a, an idiot who you're selling it to they will pay more than what you paid for it right but it's not created any new value it's still the same thing if everybody in the whole economy did that all that would eventually cancel out everyone would would rip everybody else off. And no new value fundamentally would actually have been created. The raw material cannot create new value. It's only by ap applying human labour to that raw material, by carving it in some way, by doing something with it, that you create new value that allows it to be sold uh, correctly at a higher, a higher price. Now, uh, it's this that is the basis of profit. It's the exploitation specifically of the working class, of the labour power of the working class that is the basis for surplus value, what Marx calls surplus value, which, which we uh, understand to be profit. So to, to illustrate this exploitation and, and where this profit comes from, where this surplus value comes from, there's a whole section in Capital uh, about the working day. So if we take an average eight hour working day, we could say that the first four hours of that day, the worker covers his wages, covers the value of his uh, labour power. But because he's selling his labour power and not just his labour, it's a contract for his, his capacity to work, not just the work itself. Um, <clears throat> because that is the case, he has to then work another four hours above and beyond what he's already produced to cover the cost of his wages. Now this is surplus labour time. It's unpaid labour and that, is the, that extra four hours there is the source of profit. 
And the drive to create more profit obviously leads the capitalists to try and extract more and more surplus from the working class. This can be done by lengthening the working day. Instead of eight hours, have 10 hours, 12 hours. So that instead of just four hours surplus, you've got six hours or eight hours surplus. And that creates obviously more profit. Alternatively, you can increase the intensity of the work, force the worker to cover the cost of his wages in three hours instead of four by working extra hard, by working even quicker. And then you've got uh, extra, you've got five hours profit, uh, five hours surplus labor time uh, producing profit instead of uh, four. These are obviously the methods that we understand to be the exploitation of the working class, the intensification of the exploitation of the working class. And there are limits to these methods, obviously physical limits. There are only 24 hours in a day. There's only so far you can, uh, you can push people uh, when it comes to lengthening the working day. And there are also moral and social questions involved. Past conquest of the working class, the expected standards of living. There are certain things, that certain uh, barriers that the capitalists either can't or would find very difficult to go beyond because of historical experience and this sort of thing. It's that sort of thing that can cause social unrest, and so on, uh, which the capitalists obviously don't have an interest in provoking. The point is that it's this discovery of the source of surplus labour, the thing that I mentioned before that, that Ricardo and Smith were unable to, to get to the bottom of, that human relationship, the, the relationship between human labour and capital, that is uh, the basis of the Marxist theory of, of Marxist economics, and it's what leads us to our theories of, of economic crisis as well. Um, because obviously, by understanding this process, by understanding what I've just described, it means that workers are necessarily paid less than the full value of the commodities, of the goods that they produce. Which means that if the mass of people then don't have the wealth to buy back all the commodities that are being produced, because it's the vast majority of people who do the production, right? It's a tiny number who actually own the means of production. All those people are expected to buy back those goods that, that are produced. At a certain stage, that will lead to a crisis of overproduction. That's what we mean by overproduction. Now, in extract 20... Have I skipped over 19? I don't know. Well, you can see what 19 is anyway. I've just oh, yeah. Okay, so that's the limits of, the, of exploitation is extract 19. Extract 20, then, which is the last one. You can see, actually, this is Marx commenting on another classical economist who, who, un who did actually understand this fundamental contradiction in capitalism, this, this, this thing that, that uh, you know, workers are paid less than the full value of the goods that they produce, a guy called Sismondi. And in that respect, Sismondi actually stood above Ricardo, who was, he was better on, on this point than Ricardo, because Ricardo didn't really understand fundamental contradictions in capitalism, didn't understand theories of crisis and overproduction and so on. And Marx explains here that Sismondi did actually understand the main, the main point here, and it was on the basis of the, these ideas that Marx was able to develop. It was a fusion of all these different ideas from these different classical economists that Marx was able to develop into his theory the labour theory of value and how that leads to crises of overproduction and so on. Ultimately, as it says in that extract, Sismondi was limited. He was actually uh, an under-consumptionist as opposed to someone who uh, ascribed, sub subscribed to the, labor th uh, to the theory of crisis of overproduction. I, I, I'm not going to go into under-consumptionism because I, I guess that will basically be covered in uh, James's session later on the post-war boom and Keynesian economics and so on. Um, <clears throat> But uh, he had limitations, basically, but Marx, again, was able to build on that and overcome it, uh, and so on. And uh, this is important for us because, obviously, it's this theory, I would say, this, this theory of the crisis of overproduction, which can only be understood on the basis of a labour theory of value, which is the only explanation for the crisis that the world is facing uh, today. Now, the conclusion, then, we can say that the conclusion from these theories, for, specifically from the labour theory of value, is every bit as radical as the bourgeois politicians and political economists and so on uh, were afraid of. Uh, because it basically suggests that the only sustainable route to further economic development is to end that fundamental contradiction, the contradiction between the social production of commodities by human labour of the working class and so on, to end the contradiction between that and the private appropriation of those things by uh, the capitalist class. Because if you don't, if, as long as that contradiction exists, you will have crisis and all the rest of it. Uh, and it's only by understanding the labour theory of value that we, uh, that we get that. So it's just as radical as they were afraid of. And Marx was able to take it to its logical conclusion. 
So I, I would just say that, uh, I mean, hopefully I've, I've, try, I've tried to demonstrate these ideas are the product of a long period of economic development. And in my opinion, they, they, we, these are the ideas to study. Uh, if you want to understand classical economy, fair enough, might as well, um, if you've got the time. But the way to do so is to study Marx's ideas. They are the high point. That is the highest point of political economy. Since then, it's been da a downward trajectory. They, they, the bourgeois ditched political economy in favour of, as I say, modelling, mathematics, all you, like worthwhile pursuits, but not for understanding the economy. Um, and marginal utility theory and this sort of thing. In the words of Rob Sewell, these people are, are theoretically illiterate, uh, the, the kind of economists that, that we have uh, today from the, point of, from the standpoint of political economy. So for us, we should be studying Marx as the highest point, as the highest development of these kind of ideas to understand the capitalist system uh, as a whole. Uh, and hopefully, uh, hopefully that's what the rest of today will be about.